tonight I'm going to talk about moving beyond worry and anxiety. Does that sound even remotely good to any person here? How many of you have something in your life right now that you could worry about and be very anxious about if you just didn't decide not to? Most people do, and if you don't have anything today, you might have something tomorrow or the next day, and that's not like a negative comment, that's just life is real, and we never know exactly what's going to come our way, but we do know God. We don't have to live in fear because He's with us, and He's on our side. I had a lot of bad things happen to me in the early years of my life, and I got to the point where I was afraid of bad things happening. Proverbs 15, 15 calls that evil forebodings, where you just kind of have this sensing around you that you're waiting for the next disaster. And I've learned instead of doing that, to expect something good to happen in my life and to expect it on purpose. You can choose your own thoughts. You don't have to just think whatever falls in your head. You can cast out wrong things and choose right things. And worry actually begins with a thought. Faith, I believe, starts in our heart. It's a gift of God, but it's released through us thinking and speaking right things. And when we have a problem, we can either do what the devil wants us to do and worry about it and get all anxious and try to figure things out. Worry, anxiety, reasoning, three major torments in our life. Or we can do what God wants us to do, and we can choose to trust Him. We can think loving, trusting thoughts and think about the promises of God. Worry enters our life through thoughts, but the Bible teaches us to cast all of our care on God because He cares for us. Every time we have a problem in our house, Dave has one answer. Dave and I have been married 44 years, and in 44 years, every time we have a problem, Dave has one answer. I don't even need to go ask Dave what he thinks because I already know what the answer is going to be. If I have a problem and I talk to Dave about it, I already know what the answer is going to be. So if I want to hear any other answer other than the one he's going to give me, I go talk to someone else. <laughs> because what Dave always says is, cast your care. Cast your care. You know, the word cast, if you look it up, means to pitch or to throw. So it seems like if we're going to get rid of these worries and anxieties, we're going to have to get a little bit violent with them. And maybe some of you have just been putting up with some nonsense from the devil, and you need to just get a little more violent. It's okay once in a while to be a violent Christian if you're being violent against the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says the kingdom of God has suffered violence, but the violent take it by force. So tonight, I'm going to give you permission to be a little bit violent in the right way and to say, I am not going to put up with worry and fear and anxiety and every kind of mental torment any longer. Those are from Satan, from the pit of hell, and I am not going to let Satan steal what Jesus died to give me. And if you don't do that, and if you don't do that, then he'll continue to steal from you because no matter what I believe, it's not going to help you unless you believe it. And no matter what the Bible says, it's not going to help you unless you believe it. And just knowing it won't help you. You have to act on it. We cannot be passive. Passive people want something good to happen, and they're just going to wait and see if it does. They got a lot of wishbone and no backbone. They don't do much about anything except think somebody else should solve the problem. It's good to read a good book once in a while on spiritual warfare because you're reminded that you have to be aggressive against the enemy. You can't just hope he leaves you alone. He hates you. He doesn't like anything about your walk with God. He doesn't want you making any kind of progress. And if you are going to attempt to be a Christian, he's going to try to keep you a miserable Christian. So nobody wants to look at you and have what you have. Amen? Amen? Well, worry sees the problem, but it doesn't see God. I don't think it's wrong to see the problem. Matter of fact, I think we should look at our problems squarely, and then we need to tell them where they stand in relationship to God. Worry sees the problem, but faith sees the God who can handle the problem. Let's look at Romans 4, verse 18. And don't ever just say, well, you know, I'm just a worrier. 
I can't help it. I'm just a worrier. I just worry about my kids when they go out at night. Some people don't even feel like they're good parents if they don't worry about their kids. I worry about mine. I sleep. Because you know what? Whatever they're going to do, you worrying about it ain't going to stop it. You pray. You trust God. And you go to sleep. Romans 4.18, for Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped on in faith that he would become the father of many nations, just as he had been promised. God had told him, numberless shall your descendants be. But there was a problem. Abraham and his wife Sarah were both old, like really old, like 90 and 100 old. And Sarah was long past childbearing years, and she'd never had a child, and yet she'd already had what we now call the change of life. And Abraham was too old to father a child. So they had a rather impossible situation. And in verse 19, it says, Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body. He didn't weaken in faith even when he looked at himself and said, this looks quite impossible. Even when he looked at Sarah and said, impossible. <laughs> His body was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old. Nor when he considered, when he thought about the barrenness of Sarah's deadened womb. It says, no unbelief or distrust made him waver, doubtingly questioned concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. I like to use this story about Abraham as an example because it amazes me that he had such a huge problem, really an impossible situation, and yet he saw beyond the problem. He didn't just worry about the problem, he hung on to the promise of God. And that's what we have to do. In whatever situation you're in right now in your life, whether it's something with your kids or your marriage or your finances or you think you're never going to recover from your past or you're fighting with some kind of a, an addiction or some kind of a, a sin that just keeps trying to cling to you. Whatever it is, you have to know that God is greater than any problem that you have. And you have to not worry because when you pray and then you worry, the worry nullifies your prayer. Prayer is something you do instead of worry. It's not something you do with worry. It's what you do instead of worry. I want to make sure you understand that. If we pray and then worry, we're saying with our mouth that we're depending on God, but we're saying with our actions that we don't really believe that God's going to come through, so we're going to worry and have a backup plan just in case He doesn't. Now, I know about worry because I had lots of problems with worry, and in particular, I had a lot of problems with reasoning. We're going to get around to that in just a minute. Faith sees God, and faith knows something that it can't see. You know, faith sees God, but it doesn't see God with its natural eyes. It sees God with its heart. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And those that come to God must believe that He is. I want to stop there just a minute. Must believe that He is. Not just that He is somewhere out there in the sky. But do you know that He is right here, right now? God is here, right here, right now. And when you leave the building to go to your car, He's with you. And when you go home, He's with you in your home. And when you go to bed, He's there. And when you wake up in the morning, He's there. And when you come back in the morning, He's here. And the wonderful thing about God as a spirit is He's intimately with every one of us all the time. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He is the great I Am. He is. And I was thinking about that today in the hotel room and I thought, you know, I'd like to take the next week or two and just really meditate on that a lot. Just stop several times every day and say, God is here. Anybody want to join me in that little goal? Why don't you just try to stop at least 10 times and just say out loud, 
God is here. God is here. We talked last night about fear, and all over the Bible it says, fear not. Why? One reason only is ever given, for I am with you. <laughs> we don't have to know what God is going to do. We don't have to know when he's going to do it. All we need to know is that he is, and he has a plan, and at the right time, not our time, but at the right time, God will execute that plan. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something that's just bubbling up in my heart right now. God is working in your life, every single one of you, God is working in your life right now in ways that you cannot feel, don't see, and don't understand. And just because what's going on in your life right now doesn't feel good doesn't mean God's not working. And everything that, that we go through, we need to lift up our voice and say, God, I believe you're working in my life right now. I'm expecting something good. Exodus 3, 9 through 14. Now behold, the cry of the Israelites has come to me, and I've also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, he's talking to Moses, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is just a side note, but I think it's interesting that when the Israelites were crying out to God, God had to find a man that he could work through in order to bring deliverance to them. And every time somebody prays for help, God's looking for somebody, probably a lot of you, or a lot of you watching by TV, that he wants to work through to bring that help. God doesn't work apart from man. He works with man. We are partners. Partners with God. And it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. Why would God need me to preach the gospel? Or why would he even let me preach the gospel? Why would he let me be part of this? He could preach the gospel through angels. But he wants to work through people. And Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will surely be with you. And this is the sign to you that I have sent you. The sign that God has sent us is when he's with us. I know that God is with me when I preach the gospel. I know that. I don't see him. I don't maybe feel him in the way that we might think about feeling, but I do feel him in that I know that there's no way that I could do this if it wasn't God. And God is with you in your situations. Some of you are in very difficult situations. And yet in the midst of that, you have joy and peace and you have hope. And only God can give us that. God is with you. Just because you have a problem, that does not mean that God has abandoned you. God is with you. When you have brought this people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain of Horeb or Sinai. And Moses continued and he said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, well, then what's his name? What shall I say to them? And I love the way God explains himself. He doesn't give you a whole lot of information. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am. <laughs> and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites. I am. I am here right now. The great I am who's everywhere all the time, watching over every person, involved in every person's life. Even right now, chasing those people that are living in sin and trying to woo them into a relationship. You ought to think about sometime about all the places that God had to follow you into before you finally woke up. Come on now. I am. Who is he? Who is this God? I am. Not I was, not I will be. He didn't say I am the great I was. He didn't say I am the great I will be. He said I am the great I am. Now yes, he was in yesterday because when yesterday was there, 
He was being I am. But now that yesterday is over, <laughs> it doesn't do us any good to try to go back over there and worry about yesterday because God's done with that. He's not in that anymore. And it doesn't do us any good to try to get into tomorrow trying to figure that out because he's not over there yet either. Now, we know that God is in. There is no time where God's at. But I'm talking about for us. He's right here, right now, for us. And if we will not waste our time in yesterday and tomorrow, God will give us all the information that we need, the leadership and the guidance for this day today. But it's something we're going to have to do on purpose. I said it's something that we are going to have to do on purpose because Satan is going to try to steal it from us. It's a wonderful thing to think that I don't have to have a thought beyond what I'm doing right now. I don't have to have any concern about this. If I look at my calendar for the last year, if I looked at my calendar for the last 30 years, I would think, how is it humanly possible to do that? If I look at my calendar for one year, I'm like, how did I do all that? And yet, you know what? It really wasn't even that big of a deal. Because when you take things one at a time, God gives you what you need. And I'm sure that many of you have things looming out there in the future that you know is going to require answers. And you don't have those answers. But you know what? The greatest way that you can show faith in God is to refuse to worry about it, refuse to think about it excessively, and every time it comes to your brain, just say, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know the God who does know what I'm going to do. And that's when we get over into the miracle realm with God, where He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we could ever dare to hope, ask, or think. Many of you have got a wonderful testimony in your life of what God has done for you. And God has brought you some, from some places that nobody would ever thought that you could have recovered from. And of course, I have that same testimony myself. And I'm telling you what, God is no respecter of persons. His promises are not for somebody else or an elite few. They are for you. Every single one of you. The promises of God are for you. You. The promises of God are for you. God loves you. And he's got a good plan for you. And you need to stand up to the enemy and tell him to shut up, stop lying to you. And you need to begin to believe God. Matthew 14, 27. You got to fight the good fight of faith. Get a little bit violent. It's okay. A lot of you have had practice of being violent in the wrong way. I know I did. Now let's have a, a holy violence once in a while against the enemy to say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to waste my life trying to figure out what I'm going to do every time I turn around. God's in control, not me. You're talking to yourself anyway. You might as well start saying something that makes sense. <laughs> Verse 25, Matthew 14, 25. And in the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, Ah, it's a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. But instantly he spoke to them and said, Take courage, I am. I love it. It says so little, but it says so much. How many of you can sense that in that little phrase, I am? For most of the world, it wouldn't make any sense at all. But for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we get it. He is here right now. And he is taking care of your situation. You don't have to worry. God will do one of two things if you have a problem. He will either remove the problem which is always our first choice. <laughs> and usually the only thing that we think we can even be remotely satisfied with. He will either remove the problem or he will give you the strength, the grace, the ability to go through the problem. Now I know we don't like the going through part, but until you come to a place of faith in your walk with God, where you can have either or and be satisfied either way, you're going to have a rough ride. Because if the only way you're ever going to be happy is for God to get rid of everything that bothers you, irritates you, or is hard, 
then you're going to be fighting all your life. But I'm telling you, if you can say, God, I know you'll do one of two things. You're either going to remove this, you're going to move it, you're going to take it away, or you're going to give me the grace to deal with it. And if we can trust God enough to leave that choice up to him, because if he lets us go through it, then he's got a purpose in mind. There's something we're going to get out of it that we need. Did you hear me? There's something we're going to get out of it that we need. And I know we don't like that. And probably some of you right now would like to stone me because you're thinking, if you're trying to tell me that what I'm going through is something that's going to work out good for me, lady, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, not to be offensive, but then I guess I just have to say, then go ahead and be miserable. Because if you don't trust God, you're going to be miserable. That's the only choice you have. Trusting God is wonderful. It's so wonderful to just say, I don't understand this, but I believe God's going to work it out. I do not understand this. It hurts so bad, I feel like I can't stand it, but I believe that God is going to work it out. Some way, somehow, I believe that God is going to work it out. You know, honestly and truly, when you're in a difficult situation, if God is with you and you know that, and He is with you, but if you know that, if you know that God is with you and you believe that He's directing you, and you believe that in the midst of that difficulty that you're growing spiritually. How many of you can just feel yourself growing spiritually when you're in those hard times? And it hurts, but you know, even a teenager growing up hurts. Growth always hurts. But when you're in that kind of a situation, if you can say, you know what, God, I trust you. It's just like all the frustration goes away. And God's got a piece of soft clay that he can work with to do beautiful and wonderful things. Let me tell you something. Everything doesn't turn out rosy in my life. It's actually almost, well, it is really. It's not almost. It's, it's just downright hysterical, the stuff that happens to us when we're out on the road. This conference here, I've not returned to my hotel room one time and been able to get in the door with the key. <laughs> not once. Not one time. And one time they even gave us new keys and those keys wouldn't work. It's rather interesting when I finish doing this and all the people are clapping and cheering and I'm having such a wonderful time. And then I go back to the hotel room and have to sit on the floor, lean against the hall because I can't get in my room. And I can't even begin to tell you how many times that happens. The people traveling with me can get in their rooms, but I can't get in my room. I went through all the years, please listen to me, I went through all the years of trying to find some way to live where I had enough faith, where I never had those problems, and where when I did get a problem, I could rebuke the devil and believe God and make that problem go away. And I just about killed myself with frustration. And finally I decided, oh, I'm supposed to trust God. And if God doesn't get rid of it, then I trust God to take me through it. We trust God's timing, we trust His wisdom, we trust His ways, and by doing that, guess what happens? We can enjoy every single day of the journey. We don't have to just be happy when we arrive and get it all our way. We can enjoy every single day, even of the wait. Now that's what I call real, bold, mature Christianity. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full 
the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now, and so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard. De zon gaat op en de wereld is mooi. Maar dan ineens stormopkomst. Laat je niet door je gevoelens leiden. Joyce Meyer laat je zien hoe het anders kan. In haar boek Emoties in Balans. Bestel het boek Emoties in Balans nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.